So Shweta, you, you have this item. Yeah, so um, last year we got a great guidance from the TOC members on that one page of the steel strategy for 2021. Um, but we started very late, so it was a rush rush, um, which was also helped for the KubeCon, which was also helped to set up the roadmap for the individual working group leads. Um, but I would like to start now that the July is starting, I would like to start that one pager from the TOC, the vision and the strategy for 2022, so that we have enough time and then we can take that as a roadmap for the individual teams. You said for 2022. Mm -hmm. 2022. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had asked to ping us back <laughs> mid year. So that's what yes. this is, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, last year, uh, uh, Neeraj, I started around October. It went up to November. And it was really a very, very hard in December to even complete the one pager before the STO leads, working group leads can provide the 2021 yearly roadmap. So it was a rush throughout so, the year. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask if we can just, can we set a, do we, do we have a roadmap, like a timeline for when we need this done by? So uh, that's a great question. If we start like uh, since the July started, right? If we get that done by end of August, that will be a great time ahead for the working group leads to start their yearly roadmap. So it's not in the middle of the release, right? And they are done by October, end of November. So then we are ready for the next year. And yeah, I would have said August, me. September timeframe. Yeah, that seems a little bit too much time to me, but. Same here. Oh. So, so this year, KubeCon is a little bit earlier too, uh, with the conference season. Um, it might make sense to be a little bit earlier. I think the conference is uh, October-ish. So be good. maybe end of September is some good middle ground. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I guess the, the question is, you know, if we have another Istio con uh -huh. early next year, right, when would we present the roadmap? KubeCon in October or Istio con in... Yeah, early Q1. Yeah. Right, I don't uh, want to be so Louis, you, your audio is not that clear for me. I don't know if it's clear for everyone else. I'm sorry, did you say end of September or something else? I, I couldn't hear. Was that me you couldn't hear or Niraj? Niraj, I could hear you well. No, no, no. I was just saying I couldn't get Louis well. But anyways, let's move oh, on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, I can hear Louis okay. Niraj, it's a you problem. It's not a me problem. Uh, it has been years since somebody has said that. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, yes. So, I mean, I don't think we, we're totally driven by the KubeCon schedule anymore, correct? Right from a, especially for this content. I agree. Speak about is your roadmap, but they may not give you a slot. So I would around the dates and everything. So it's still kind of, I guess today. Sorry, then you broke up there at the end. Or no, I was just saying, we don't know the exact amounts of dates of Istio Combo next year, right? Right. Um, uh, Louis, I think there are two things that you're trying to merge here, right? So I, in at least my two cents here, I agree with you that guiding by going our roadmap planning around KubeCon doesn't make much sense anymore, given the kind of just the publicity and the kind of uh, you know content they want and the, how the roadmap usually goes, like a session around that. IstioCon, even though the dates are murky, makes more sense. 
irrespective, I think, if it feels like our target is to come and finish this by November, because as Shweta said, last year when we started around October, we couldn't finish things and December was a wash. So it feels like what Swen was saying, what's our target end of November or mid of November, if TOC can submit this, it seems reasonable to me, if everyone agrees. Yeah, that's mid, mid Q4 seems about right. I mean, we need a target for the working groups to all finish their parts, right? Yeah, yeah. We need to come back from that. Yeah. The late November data is late for the working group leads because that's the time of our release too. We normally release the first week of December, so they are not. And then last two weeks are holidays, so the working group leads are never able to complete by the end of the year. Ideally, the things from the TOC and the working group uh, leads should be completed in in December, right? So we are ready for Q1. Does it have to be? I mean, the working group leads could deliver, deliver the first two weeks of January, right? Yeah, but then they need the direction for Q1, please. So it, it gets late. Uh, okay. Uh, for me, I mean, if you ask me, do we have enough signals to start thinking about a roadmap? Maybe yes, but beyond one or two points, I don't have enough signals from users this year so far. Right? We have made progress on the few things that we promised. So it's kind of hard to plan right now, at least for me. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm thinking the same too. I mean, how is this different than what we have right now? I think, uh, and do we have enough feedback to make changes? Right, I mean, we've only delivered <coughs> the first two releases of this year. Right? So we've only made two releases worth of progress on the, the, the annual goals. Uh -huh. I've had one release worth of feedback on it. 1.1 releases worth of feedback on, on our progress. So yeah, I, I tend to agree, obviously, it's not something we can start now. So I guess we'll have a third release in August. We would have had two and a bit releases worth of, three and a bit worth of uh -huh. releases worth of feedback if we can deliver roadmap, let's say mid to late October. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a plan. And what did you mean? The that's when the we would release the one pager, or that's when you mean we'd actually have a roadmap from the workers. I hope the latter. The one I think that's too late. Like I, I would do the one pager by the end of September at the latest, just so the working group leads have more time. That's ideal, Swain. I, I hope for that. If we start it in mid September, what would you need? Like, how, how do we collect the feedback? What would you need so that you know we are close to what the user feedback is? So, Shweta, I mean, I was creating this year's roadmap, right? I'm mostly with help from other TOC members. For me, the UX working group feedback and in general, some survey feedback and doing the empathy session, it was clear that day two operations was a problem, right? So all of that fit nicely into the day two operations uh, theme of the year. Uh, now, it doesn't have to be like that. Sometimes things don't just come together. We can start putting down, you know, our thoughts in a page and like, not like, a theme, but see if a theme emerges. We can do that based on what we are seeing. But currently, I have just not seen or heard enough. Uh, there are a few things I can say we want to do, but I don't know if that's what users want. So then there are two things, Neeraj, right? One is the um, straw man bullet point sheet, right? Two, what kind of service we need, right? Because we still have enough time to collect the user feedback. Then we should start thinking, okay, what do I need to make sure that I have enough information to create this? Yeah. I would go for another empathy session before I put any concrete thoughts down, if we can do that. Because at least for me, uh, I don't know about the other TOC members. I'm, I'm guessing they will agree with me. That was really helpful. And then the UX uh, surveys, both of them were helpful. So we are continuing the UX service. We should plan some empathy session if we can have enough uh, end user feedback. And then, you know, 
collect those two and start putting our thoughts together. We have around right. two users who have signed up for interviews around upgrade experience. We might be able to pick one or two of those to carry over into a user empathy session, both around how day two has changed in 2021 and kind of what's left in their eyes. Right, so that's the other thing. We need those users to have used the new releases. Yes, that, that is the case. At least that, that's what they stated in their fee survey feedback, that they've used the CO110. But we would like them to have used Istio 111 probably before we. Yeah, they haven't used that yet. Right. How, how much time do we need after 111 goes out before we get enough feedback? I think that's well, that's a great question. Right now, we have, I, I think, 12 respondents on 110. And we are right around one month after release. I would hope that we would see about the same level of feedback uh, on 111. So for the 110 one, do we know how much percentage are evaluating and how much percentage are actually you know, running uh, in a more realistic environment? OK. Oh, sorry, maybe I misunderstood the question. Are you asking, do we know what percent of people who upgraded to 110 responded to the survey? No, I'm asking. Uh, <laughs> Are they using Istio 110 for evaluation or testing, or are they running in production? Sorry about that. We, we do have the first question on the survey is basically, how much upgrading to 110 have you? And the options are some non-production or test meshes, some production meshes, or all of our meshes. So that should give some signal into whether it's sort of an evaluative use case or actually in production. OK, that's cool. But Here is a suggestion. Uh, go ahead, Drake. Yeah, I mean, we, we want that after 111, not out of 110. I mean, 110 is a useful data point, but yeah. right, we're still making progress on these things. Um, and, and while 112, right, which is the last release of the year, right, we, we can't write the roadmap having gotten feedback on 112. Um. Yeah, so if you want the feedback on the 11, so Mitch said uh, he has about right, a dozen feedback. Yeah, I think we can expect decent no. feedback on 111 by mid September. Ten. Right. Yeah, a month and a bit, six weeks after the release ish. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I mean, I think Google will probably be able to help as well. That feedback. Um, we should have had some feedback from users at that point on Anthos Service Mesh. So, um, well, it will be close because we tend to release about a month after open source. Yeah, that's the interesting timing. The vendors probably take some time to upgrade. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. It's gonna be it's gonna be pretty intense time. Yeah. I mean, Niraj, how long does it take you guys to ship a release after the open source release? Well, it depends if we want every release or not, and then uh, any anything between thirty days or forty five days, I would say. Sometimes it stretches more if we have a private feature that a user wants on a new on that is based on a new open source feature, right? But thirty days to forty five days is average. Okay. Uh, Brian or Kevin, what about you guys? I don't know if you ship every release or not, but uh, we don't. We tend to lag behind. The, by at the moment by one release, although we'll be fixing that uh, in the next couple of months so that we're uh, running close to tip. Okay. So uh, what, what so do TUSC members think, right? I mean, that's giving time for the vendors to get feedback. I don't know how material it is. Um, what they tend to get 
very directed feedback if users have an issue. Well, that uh, would, I would make end of September time frame right very very tight yeah. in terms of feedback. Yeah. I think there are two pieces here, Louis. One is the TOC members start putting down some broader, you know, mm -hmm. must haves in their mind along with whatever information they have and the direction they want the project to go. That can start, I think, tomorrow if you like. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the baseline is well, take the existing roadmap. What would you add and subtract? Yes, exactly. Right. And if you don't have a lot of feedback, then the, the answer is not much, uh -huh. which is a good thing, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know materially how much different feedback we are going to get between 110 and 111 just because our theme is make it more better and we haven't added more features, like substantially new features to break things, right? Yeah, I feel like 110 is like a So if we could do Sorry, then you're breaking up. I'm at back. Yes. I don't know what's the okay. So I was, yeah, I'm having some network issue today. I don't know why. So, um, I was just saying, I, I think 110 is definitely a significant release. Uh, 111, I'm not sure. Is that what would be the highlight for the user to provide feedback? Like 110, we have like the network changes, the tagging, the revision, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, user facing changes. Um, 111, we might have more of the gateway API that's still in development. Um, we were thinking we would have HBone. That's probably not going to happen. So, uh, BTS, which is now called HBone, so people can understand what it means. But, mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So the telemetry API. Um, for which we already have a lot of feedback, right? We, we know people want that. Um, there will also be the WASM API, correct? Yeah, yeah. Th th those are the two big APIs, and I have added a related PSA to the mm -hmm. yeah. So those those solve known existing user experience issues, correct? Yes, right. yeah, like th this is based yeah. on yeah, this is based on prior feedback, really. But these are going to be I mean, as normal introduced as alpha APIs. So uh, I, yeah, I think it would be very useful feedback based on those APIs. Um, there's the proxy config change, which is really, again, incremental improvement for the install revisions experience. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if we get um, Brian on your point. Um, C and I being promoted. Is there is there any feedback that we can possibly get regarding operator versus Helm and sort of direction one year out? So that that would be valuable, but I, I don't think between one ten and one eleven we'll get any feedback about that. Right. I mean, I think the, the last time we had feedback, right, it was significantly bifurcated, right? There were people who used Helm in part because it was the standard within their organization. So they had to use it. They felt like they wanted to use it. And then there were people who weren't in that boat. And they were yeah, let's... happy enough to use this to cut install and our, our tooling, right? whether that was operator or, or command line. 
Yeah, I remember it was 30% uh, roughly for each of them. And if we were looking at evenly split. Yeah, exactly. And if we look at other service mesh like Kuma, right, they have instruction for both also. Yeah, so I guess another question is, what kind of feedback would we be looking for? Is it just how usable each one of those two solutions are? Or so, so I think one, one feedback potentially to, to kind of seek again would be if we decide to stand by on Helm, then would some of the users that have previously said to use is Kyokato, was it opportunistic? or was it sort of a studied preference? Um, and having one is better than two, all things being equal. Okay, so you, your, your question is, can we get, are, are you asking like, can we stop doing both? Well, the... right, oh. yeah, if, if, so right, yes. If we can stop doing both, like can we get something in that direction? Austin, uh, I I'm not entirely sure that that uh, stopping both is uh, is necessarily a good idea. I mean, Istio Cattle is really Helm installed with a, with a wrapper on top of it. Our problem is not that we have Istio Cattle. I mean, the, so operator API is probably the problem is the fact that we have two APIs and it's, it's difficult to configure. But if we uh, trim down the the you know differences in the API surface, which we are trying to do, then Helm is Helm, and if your cartel is a wrapper around Helm that is doing some additional checks, which is not necessarily bad. The, the issue is to get rid of the other APIs and, and, and to, to do what we discuss with proxy config and, and uh, promoting to beta. That's my opinion, at least. Go ahead, Nirash. Yeah, I, I think, Louis, we are getting a little bit into the weeds here. So mm. I think we don't have a clear direction on what feedback we want, right? So I think that's upon us to start guiding and then maybe include some of the other community members. So I think it's fair to start like a doc saying, okay, this is the kind of feedback we want based on features that we have already outlined in 111. Let's or in 110. Let's see if we can get that feedback. If not, we need to come up with another great game plan, right? Yeah. Yeah, agree. And also, I just want to say, don't put a user, don't put on first release of that um, fix. I should say the fixed release, like 111 one is typically they start using it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, so we're still roughly going to target a September timeline. That was the general, I think that was largely consensus. We would have some feedback after 111. Um, Uh, 111 is the first week of August, if I remember correctly. So that seems like it gives enough time for the working groups if we deliver that in early to mid-September. Yeah, that's fine. Let's target that. And between now and then, let's try to figure out what feedback we want and how we can get it. So middle September, would that be the timeline we could schedule the emphasis session? Uh, well, it would have to be before then.
tend to be very tight for feedback for E11. But I guess perhaps the feedback for when to continue to be valuable as long as it's not a telemetry or WASM or proxy config, right? And if we're not interested in feedback on those items, perhaps we could schedule the empathy session in August. What I get regarding one ten, that's where I was going. Like I think for those new APIs, I mean it's great we are releasing them, but expecting a hardened user to start using it, <laughs> it's very difficult for them. Right? If they're using yeah. Eastern production for a few releases, they won't just go and configure these uh, alpha APIs. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, I think it's fair to say also that we, you know, we'll produce a draft and then we will probably revise the draft. Exactly. The working groups will also revise their drafts. Uh, yeah, that's where I was going, Louis. It's an iteration, right? Okay. Okay, uh, we should probably move along. Ryan, you want to talk about testing, talk testing? Yeah, can you pull it up? Certainly. Thanks. I don't know if this should be reviewed here or offline. I don't know if it matters, but. So for the past um, couple of releases, I'd say back in, back since, I don't know, one five, um, we've tried to get the docs working group and the work group leads on board as to, uh, to how to prioritize doc, or testing of docs for different releases, what's P0, P1, P2, et cetera. And um, it's always a challenge to get everybody on board. So this attempts to um, codify that in a, in a way that we can automate it and just give things a um, score. So Eric and I discussed um, what we felt was important. We brought it uh, before docs. We brought it before steering. Um, steering said that TOC should make the decision as work group leads for docs um, as to what they thought of it. Um, so. If you scroll down to the design ideas, um, the things that we thought were important are um, what areas of the documentation have uh, changed and how much. Um, greater changes in documentation are more likely to need more testing. Um, if we can do it, what areas of the code that are being touched by this documentation have changed and how much. Um, Go testing has a trace command. I haven't tested it, but that might give us some sort of an idea there. Um, does the document already have automated tests? If it already has automated tests, it might not be as important to manually test it. Um, and what is being accessed um, most often by users? Um, again, if the if the top two are filled, then it's still important to consider the bottom two, um, but likely not as important. Um, and then we thought of a um, bit of scoring there. So um, taking these priorities. Prior to taking this prioritized list um, and deciding a number of um, stars or whatever unit you want to give it, with 16 stars being assigned to the top one, 12 to the next, 8 to the next, and then 4 to the bottom, and collating all these scores together in order to produce a final prioritization for the doc. And then we uh, create a spreadsheet off of this with all of the um, current documentation. So if things have been added, things have been uh, removed, those get updated automatically and importing that into uh, Google Sheets. So yeah, I'm just curious what thoughts are. And so the, the other, the, the scores are rolled up by what categorization? So um, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I'll answer what I thought I understood for that. Um, so, for instance, the um, what areas of the documentation have changed would receive 16 stars. 
um, the what areas of the code have changed um, would receive 12 stars um, based on a uh, number of lines for both of those. And then um, eight for the next one. If it doesn't have any testing, then it receives the full eight stars and um, four for the next one divided by um, page hits. And then these would all be added together. So you've got a maximum of um, 20, 30, 40 stars. And the one um, the closest to 40 stars is the most important to test. The closest to zero is the least important to test. And then we divide it up to keep the P, ah, P0 through P2. But yeah. I, I actually meant more about the roll up. Uh, so, on what categories do we roll up under? What? So, this on, would on the actual scoring. Like, what do you like mean? networking versus, like, how do we assign this back to working groups? We don't. So, this so would just be by page. page in general. All the documentation pages. Yeah, the so idea is we just we prioritize all the pages, and then we just if we if we pick the top, you know, ten percent, twenty five percent, those are the ones that have to have testing done. There, there, there really isn't anything that say that these aren't all networking pages or all security pages. Okay, and um, for automated testing, with that scoring system, it's possible for pages that do have automated testing to still rank high for testing. It is. Right? Yeah. What does that mean? So if a page has, if a page already has automated testing, but it has a lot of documentation changes or a lot of code changes, and that means somebody should go uh, through and review and make sure that uh, automated testing is actually updated and accurately testing the doc. Is it possible to know that the automated testing was updated within the release as well? Because the time, the, up, like the last update time of the automated test would probably indicate whether it was updated in concert with the doc or not. It would. Um, I guess the question is, um, I mean, if we know that that doc, if the tests for that doc were updated in the release, is that enough for us to say this page doesn't need to be tested or isn't as important to test? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, I think that's my general question. I guess the question that I'd have there is, are the, would the docs reviewers for that um, test change be looking to make sure that that document is fully tested with those changes? Is, so, I don't know, do you know, Eric, when you're looking at um, doc tests, uh, PRs, are you looking, comparing to the original document uh, Tation to see how thoroughly it's tested. I I typically do, but I don't know that that's a common statement. Okay. Right. I mean, I, I push back if, uh, and, and I've I've done it. I push back if you know somebody wants to add the, the yes, it's tested flag, but we're only testing part of the page. So this is also for something that's already tested, presumably already tested. It's got a whole bunch of changes. Um, somebody's going back and updating that test. Right. I mean, we, we would have to make sure that that happens. But that yeah. is the point of docs testing, right? It is to ensure that what the docs say is being automated. It is. So if there's, if there's a high degree of variance between the docs and what the docs test test, then uh, it's not an effective test. Agreed. Yeah. That, that seems like it's a function of the code review process. Yeah. Right? I mean, it should be. Um, so it seems like it seems reason, at least for automation, it seems reasonable if, if, if that's what's, that is the expected practice. So if the docs have been updated in the release and the tests have been updated in the release, the score would be lower. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense to me. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can check dates on SH files and verify and, and lower based on that as well. Yep. Yeah, and that, that would lower the total score, right? Not just for that, the, doc, the testing category, right? Yeah, that would lower the total score. And I think that should probably take into account code changes as well, meaning if the um, docs tests have been updated and there's a lot of code changes, then that also reduces the score. So I guess the big question yeah, it, is, does it have automated tests? OK. Yeah, it's like doc, docs tests are the denominator for all the categories. Yep. OK, I'll figure out how to um, account for that. But the rest sounds good. So yes, the other, the other is just measurement of change and then a, a, a bonus score for frequency of use. Yeah. So this is trying to get an automated um, way of scoring that just gives an accurate reflection of what needs to be tested. So we tried to think of what what would be likely to affect a user's experience with the docs from one yeah, release to another. Um, those metrics make sense to me. OK, thanks. I mean, even simpler than that, much. frequency of use oh. and not having automated tests, right? even just frequency of use would be a good ranking mechanism all on its own. Right. Yeah, frequency is definitely a good one. So your thought is, um, what's most accessed um, is the highest prioritized versus? Yeah, um, if, if we have if, if we have doc that's used a lot and is not automated. Yeah, I almost don't care how much the code has changed. Yeah, I, so I think this is a little too complicated because it's going to create like a meta bot trying too many things, and we keep tweaking the parameters forever. Just, I think that that's where I would go. Uh, first, classify whether it has an automated test or not. And then second, just rank stack based on uh, access patterns of users, because that's the most critical thing. I mean, if we keep tweaking around some uh, deep down task that no one changes, or sorry, that no one looks at, who cares? I'd assume all of the tests that we or all of the features we currently have in SDR are there because people people use them. Mm. There's there's, Again, there's some pretty big steep cliffs between some of them, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the platform page, I think we questioned them early on. So it would be good to get a statistic from the istio.io website analytic uh, website. Um, the other thing I want to say, I think I agree with Neeraj. Um, so those are the two most important thing is the, whether the page is tested um, and also you know how popular they are. And within whether the page are tested, Brian, to your point early on, some of our tests may not exactly access, um, uh, test through what the user would tell user to do. It would be nice we can highlight um, a little bit on that, because some are done on purpose. I, and I knew that because I wrote some of those tests, and we had to test a slightly different than because of a test infrastructure doesn't have like real key host and search. So what we tell user is actually slightly different on purpose than what's been tested. Um, so that might be useful information to highlight for a user. Uh -huh. OK, thanks. Uh, yeah, so Brian, just, just to you know, make sure I give my feedback correctly, I think we can go towards something more smarter and like rank stacked with some good algorithm in it. But I would recommend we start something simpler, see how it goes for a release, then tweak it. Going the other way is very difficult. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Sorry, I wasn't capturing notes, but I will. So Brian, just making sure the, the scoring you are proposing, those are internal metrics anyway, right? So they're not exposed to the user. The user wouldn't, wouldn't care. Yeah, those are internal much. metrics, um, really to find okay. out. Um, the, the top two are to find out how accurate the tests are, whether there's likeliness of ver 
variance between the tests and the either code or documentation. But if we're checking when the test changed, okay. that, that might be good enough. Yeah, I think the variant um, to indicate with tests are a little bit different. That that's valuable to the user. You you know when they find out their stuff doesn't work, and we tell them that we did test a little bit different, and maybe even can link to point a link to them. This is what we test. I think that could be valuable. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, we might be able to kill some of the pages uh, if we analyze like this particular page nobody accesses for a year or two. Good candidate for removal. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I don't know if that actually makes your life any easier, Brian, but uh, I, I think just, yeah, a ranking based on usage and then, you know, effectively bucketing by whether they're tested or not and just ranking within that. Uh, yeah. It's probably a, a great, great start, frankly. So, yeah, it uh, starts as simply and then we can expand as. We feel it's important. Just I was going to say, I think an aside here was something Lynn mentioned too, is if there's some way that we can represent or talk about how the testing might be different than what's actually on the page. Yeah, so I, I feel like that's outside that, of this. That's topic. a different, that's not this topic, but something else. Yeah, I do think that's important. Like I know the, um, a lot of the concept stuff varies just because it's a couple of example configuration elements and we write tests against them, but it, that's not going to match up with a written three paragraph document. Right. Yeah, maybe we can have a separate proposal for that. Maybe a, uh, a different indicator because we today we have test not tested. We can have maybe closely tested or partially tested, um, somehow indicate, uh, and then user can click on that for a little bit more detail. Yeah. Well, not a user, right? Well. You mean a, a developer or a member of the community, right? I well, imagine. user would be helpful, yeah, when they look at Istio.io, they can see, you know, whether the test uh, is, if the page they follow through and find a problem, they can at least tell, you know, wait, this is not fully automated. Uh, okay, I see there's a difference of what's being automated with what I'm achieving. Uh, I'm not sure users care about whether it's automated or not. I think they care whether it's yeah. tested or not. Which yeah, the and indicator for the indicator that we have for tested is whether it has automated tests. And right. if it has automated tests and they're not testing it thoroughly, then that's not meeting up with what the user expects currently. So right. I do so think it's, it's a proper audience. Right, but they don't know if we manually tested it or not. But they oh. actually oh. love or well a test indicator, right? We've seen people tweets around that. Um, they love the feature whether we actually tell them this page has been automatically tested. Uh, I, I think I, we are parsing this little bit from a developer point of view and from a user point of view. So right, so we are trying to say to a user, we have tested it or not. Internally, right now, the whether we have tested it or not is the indication only means automated testing. That's fine, but as a user, if you tell me, hey, you have a doc and it's not tested, it's just bad, right? <laughs> they don't really care. On that so, note, I mean, every release we have two thirds of our of our pages that just don't receive testing right now. I, I agree. So there are pages that don't receive any testing. There are pages that receive some manual testing, and there are pages which achieve automated testing. I think trying to pass these three things for a user is enough. Uh, like, there's enough noise there. 
if we make further classifications within automated testing, I think it's too much. I mean, it is from my point of view, we don't want to put that burden on users. Internally, we can do as much metadata about each doc that we want to improve our, our docs and testing. I don't know if users want to see so much information. Yeah, that's a good point. It could be a little bit too much for the user. I, I, and it would be only valuable when they follow exactly what the page uh, tell them to do, and it didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as a user coming in here, if I come, come to a page, um, let's say, I don't know, a concept page or whatever, and I see, hey, this page is tested, and I go through it and try to use it, and it doesn't work, I'm probably going to scratch my head for a little while and try to figure out what I did wrong, even though it could be a problem with that doc. Right, that, that's the only value for the user. In fact, that indicator is so helpful for me. Like everybody, anyone asks me a question, the first thing I check is this page is automated. Maybe they did something wrong. So always ask them to redo again. But there's maybe 5% or 1% of our pages that we didn't test exactly what they, we tell user to do. Those are the tricky ones. Yeah, I agree. I don't know. Okay, I think yeah, it's something to revisit. <laughs> okay, but uh, so uh, Brian and Rob, you feel like you have enough feedback? Right that I think I have enough feedback. Um, Yeah, this is Eric. I think it's good. Yeah. Mandar. Do you want to pitch your MSA, PSA? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I just I, I just wanted to say that uh, there are a bunch of APIs and their implementations being dropped into 1.11. And having the API PRs sort of reviewed and ready to go earlier in the release cycle is, is nicer. So uh, the, the PSA is that. Yeah, if you if you see kind of yourself tagged or anything like that on an API PR, uh, please try to uh, help move it along. Yeah. What does PSA stand for? Oh, public service announcement. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Thanks for the reminder. So, so on that note, should we recover six minutes of this meeting to go review some uh, API PRs? Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, I have one quick question on the API PRs. Since those comments in there tend to be locked, and then uh, it's difficult to know which one of those conversations are still alive, live, and which has been, you know, already resolved. Uh, can, can can the PR submitters just resolve the comments that you don't want me to look at or the other TOC? That will help. Like I look at some, and I know I've been part of it from the beginning, but when I look at again in a one month's time, I don't know how many of these comments I need to follow. Okay. And if okay. I can make an extra PSA, please, it will be very useful to have, uh, you know, a doc with uh, alternative implementation of what other people are doing, comparison with, with other products, because it's it's always difficult to to understand how we relate with other in terms of complexity, you know, so support and support.
Okay. With that, I think we are done, folks. Have a great week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.